ladies and gentlemen, dear Mr. Kotegawa, thank you very much, and also to the Kennan Institute for inviting uh, us. Um, I want to speak about the word language and the Silk Road, but to motivate why a change in policy is so absolutely urgent, I wanted to take a look at this map, uh, which is the different crisis spots in the world today. Um, and if you look at the sheer amount of these crises, you can see that we are in a pre-war situation, in a pre-World War situation, and that the pre-war situation before World War I and II looks relatively like a picnic by comparison. When a very short, a very short time ago, Turkey shot down the Russian uh, jet under a flimsy pretext, uh, immediately people in Washington in high places told us that there was absolutely no way how this could have happened without the tacit support by the White House. And uh, that immediately afterwards, President Obama and NATO came out begging Turkey uh, to illustrate how dangerous the situation is. Uh, Politico, which is a, a paper in Washington, immediately took that as an occasion to say, to remind people that the uh, nuclear arsenals of Russia and the United States are all the time on launch on warning. Uh, and that is that when an incident like this happened with the plane being shot down, uh, the, the warning to the, the military gives in one minute the options to the president. Uh, the briefing is about 30 seconds, uh, where the consequences of each option are being presented. And then the president has about three to six minutes to decide to launch or not. And I think if you uh, think about that, it should cause you to have some sleepless nights, which I would prefer than sleepwalking into uh, a new world war. Now, if you look at the fact that both Russia and China have stated very clearly that they regard both the European ballistic missile system in Eastern Europe as a first strike doctrine, uh, they regard the prompt global strike doctrine as a first strike doctrine and also the air sea battle against China, uh, uh, then um, you know this danger is highlighted especially because many military experts of Europe and the United States have warned that the situation is more dangerous than during the Cold War. Uh, even the height of the Cold War, which was obviously a little missile crisis, because right now you have no code of behavior between the American president and the Russian president, and there is no functioning red telephone. This conflict, among others, arises from the fact that the United States insists uh, that the fully polar world uh, must be maintained while Asia is rising uh, and simply that rise is causing a multipolar world. Uh, the former General Chief of Staff Chairman, uh, General Dempsey, warned uh, that the West should not go into the Tuhili trap. Uh, and that warning is obviously unheard. To add to that, the Ukraine crisis, the tensions in the South China Sea, and the unbelievable barbarism of ISIS and Boko Haram, and you get a picture of the, uh, the dangers. Equally existential is the immediate prospect of a new crash of the transatlantic financial system, uh, which you know, even the IMF recently said that there is, are no instruments left by the central banks to deal with it. They have all been used up in quantitative easing, the zero interest rate policy. So if you look at all of this, I could add to this uh, with many more uh, points. The question is, is humanity capable to change course before it is too late? Or are we moving on down on this road, which either leads to chaos, uh, because we have an uncontrolled crash of the financial system, which could evaporate the too big to fail banking system uh, in an hour, 
um, or which could eventually lead to a thermonuclear war in which humanity would be annihilated. The question is, do we have as a human species together enough intelligence and morality to change the course? Now, in the 15th century, there was a great German philosopher, uh, Nicolaus of Kuz, who is unfortunately, he's very known in Japan and in Russia, he's called Kuzansky in Russia, he's not, not so much known in China, for example. He uh, is the founder of modern natural science, at least in Europe, and he stated that if you have a complex problem, you cannot solve it by having an assortment of heterogeneous partial solutions, but you must find a higher level of reason where the contradictions are being resolved. This was a method of thinking which he called the coincidentia oppositorum, the thinking of the uh, coincidence of opposites. Uh, it has the idea that the one is of a higher order than the many. And it is that method which must be applied to define the new paradigm in the evolution of the human species. Generally, people are only willing to even consider that they should change their ways uh, when they realize that the assumptions they have been believing for a long time are shattered. Uh, and uh, that is happening right now around the globe. In Germany, this is very acute because Germany, until very recently, was a country which I always said is like under a cheese bell, uh, you know, where no air would come from the outside and you wouldn't smell the, the stink of the cheese. But now, you know, because of the refugee crisis, we have this year probably 1.5 million refugees um, coming. I'm sorry, I missed it, I forgot to continue. This was the annihilation of the human species, and this is uh, Nicolas of Musa. Uh, in this refugee crisis, where you have uh, this year probably 1.5 million people coming to Germany, it's detonating the European unity, there is no more solidarity. Many countries refuse to take any. Uh, 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 refugees at all, <coughs> and you know now all of a sudden uh, people realize that you know with these people who are all running away from hunger, war, uh, especially in the Middle East, in Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, you know the reality comes to Germany. The war comes to Germany. The world has entered Germany. So there is a profound rethinking. Uh, about the root causes of the crisis, uh, <clears throat> namely the Anglo-American wars based on lies in the Middle East, and uh, that Saudi Arabia is financing uh, first the Mujahideen, then Al-Nusra, Al-Qaeda, and now uh, ISIS. And that has created a sudden discussion in all circles in Germany, uh, mostly you know, internally, but there is a, a real thinking, what is wrong and where is the real self-interest of Germany? Is it the right thing that Germany should just follow whatever Washington and London say? Or does Germany have a self-interest which somehow cannot be only in the coalition with the United States? And that is why, uh, since the refugee crisis has started, uh, Germany is also supporting Russia's move uh, in Syria, and also France has shifted. Uh, and this is uh, uh, very, uh, very important. Now, it is obvious that if you have a barbaric phenomena like ISIS, uh, and you all have seen the kind of uh, deeds they have committed, the last thing, the uh, Paris uh, terrorism, these people must be militarily destroyed. That is very, very clear. You cannot negotiate with them. But if you only go with, it, with the military, you create no more terrorists. This is a hydra. For each terrorist you kill, you create 50 new ones because you have the so-called collateral damage, civilians who get uh, killed. Uh, and that is, uh, therefore, you have to have something else, and that is you have to have a real comprehensive development plan for the Middle East and for Africa. 
Uh, because unless you give young people, especially young men, a hope for the future, which they don't have right now, not only if they don't have a hope in the United States, in the Middle East and in Africa, young people have no hope. And you have to give them a future by giving them a chance to raise a family, to become a scientist, a doctor, an architect, uh, if you want to try out the environment for the jihadists to the food. Uh, now, uh, this plan is a report which the Schiller Institute uh, published last year. Uh, it's called the World Bank, uh, the new silk road becomes the World Bank Bridge. Now, the uh, yellow, uh, the yellow uh, uh, lines here, this is the silk road. Uh, China is presently building in but you know we have worked on this plan for 25 years actually, uh, and as you can see, it involves large corridors, uh, bridges, tunnels, uh, which eventually, uh, which will eventually will allow you to go from the southern tip of Argentina and Peru all the way to the Americas, the Bering Strait, the Eurasian land bridge, and to the case of Hope or India all the way to Indonesia and Australia uh, <coughs> by train, by fast train. Uh, and the Maglev or other fast train system you will be able to go more quickly than by ship, uh, which if you have an increased production uh, time is a very important uh, factor. Uh, now, uh, much of Southwest Asia uh, has been gone back into the Stone Age, as uh, Schwarzkopf, General Schwarzkopf uh, announced at the time. Much of it was desert, uh, uh, much of it was desert, uh, is desert, and therefore we propose as part of this World Bank protocol to take the entire region from Central Asia, the Caucasus to the Gulf, from Afghanistan to the Mediterranean and take that region as one region. Now obviously all of this is desert. If you fly by plane over there, you can see that there is not one green grass. Uh, so therefore the first thing to do is one has to declare war on the desert. Now you can do that by uh, creating fresh water, uh, you can desalinate uh, ocean water in large quantities through peaceful nuclear energy, you can tap into aquifers, you can, uh, uh, iron, you can make an ionization of uh, the atmosphere's moisture, you create new rain patterns, uh, you can redirect certain river systems. And you know, then well, after you have developed the water, you can put in uh, infrastructure corridors. There is no reason why this region of the world should not look in a couple of decades like we turn to Germany. Germany has a perfect developed infrastructure integrating waterways, highways, uh, and uh, fast train systems. And that way, you create the conditions for the location of industries and new cities. Now, why do I think that this has a chance of working? Because all the neighbors of the Middle East have a fundamental security interest for this to happen. Now, Russia is uh, immediately threatened by ISIS because half of the ISIS leadership is Chechens. Uh, also, uh, the uh, <coughs> Viktor Ivanov, the Russian drug czar, has uh, stated repeatedly that the, this was before ISIS, but that the largest security problem for Russia is the drug traffic coming from Afghanistan, which has increased 40 times since NATO uh, is in Afghanistan. <coughs> now, China has a big interest uh, as well, uh, and that is. <coughs> Uh, that is the uh, Uyghurs, Uyghurs, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, uh, who are uh, closely tied with ISIS. Now, it just happens that today, of all places, uh, unexpectedly, the Wall Street Journal says had the headline, Can Beijing sell the Silk Road as a Marshall Plan against terror? Uh, so I get uh, <coughs> surprising support from the Wall Street Journal. And they make the point that the West in the past has always 
ignored terrorism hitting in Xinjiang by saying this is just some legitimate rebels against the authoritarian Chinese government. But here, uh, the author admits that the Uyghurs are closely connected uh, to ISIS and that the only way China could solve this terrorism problem is by extending the Silk Road into this region. Now, for Japan, um, I mean, every region of the world would obviously uh, benefit from, uh, from, from this plan. Uh, for, for Japan, the participation in the great projects of the World Bank, which would revive uh, the tradition of the Meiji restoration of O Kubo, Toshimishi, and O Kuma. Who were inspired by uh, Alexander Hamilton and Friedrich List, who insisted that the only source of wealth is not the possession of raw materials and it is not uh, buying cheap selling expenses, but the only source of wealth in society is the development of the creativity of the labor, labor force. And that tradition was what was continued by the Nietzsche uh, policy in the post-war period of Japan and also in the Global, Infra uh, global Infrastructure Fund, uh, which had several of the projects which we have taken up in the World Bank, which have thought, but which have not been pursued in a necessary way by Japan. Now, one of these projects, uh, uh, oh yeah, here you have yeah, one of these projects was this, the Car Canal, uh, which if you have an increased trade flow in the Pacific region, uh, then uh, this is very important because the uh, Malacca trade is completely overworked. Uh, you have uh, the second Panama Canal being built right now by China in uh, Nicaragua. Uh, and the Mekong Delta uh, was also planned, but uh, only partially sustainable uh, technologies uh, soon, but it's still very, very urgent. The Trans Aqua uh, project, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the Trans Aqua project is a large uh, water project which will bring water from the Congo River to Lake Chad and irrigate much of the Sahel zone and the uh, Sahara. Now, the United States, uh, build, the building of the Bering Strait uh, is uh, presently uh, very much up to date. Uh, President Putin has declared that Russia wants to build the Bering Strait Tunnel, practically no matter what the United States uh, say. Uh, and given the recent collaboration of the Russian Chinese, uh, collaboration between the one bank, one road policy and the Eurasian Economic Union, especially for Siberia and the Far East, uh, this is back on the agenda. Now, the United States, uh, as uh, Jeff uh, Steinberg was just elaborating, uh, China built already 18,000 kilometer fast train system. And uh, when you travel with Chinese fast train systems, they're smooth. They are quick, they are, they are excellent technology. How much does the United States build in the same period? Zero. Uh, so they need virtually 50,000 kilometer fast train if they want to revive. Um, they need new science cities. Uh, now, when we discuss this in the United States, people, you know, when they put out a pamphlet, they, they put out a picture of a new city from China. And I said, I don't want ugly cities. Uh, you know, I don't want cities to look like Houston and who are just ugly. And this is a, a picture from the Renaissance from Italy. This is quite perfect city where you see the golden beam and you have certain architectural beauty. But if you build new cities, I insist that they should be beautiful. Uh, now, uh, Ukraine, another problem. The collaboration between Europe and the Eurasian Economic <coughs> Union and the one road, one bed policy for the construction of the corridors would unite Ukraine in a larger economic uh, development perspective and therefore eliminating the war danger, bringing prosper prosperity uh, to Ukraine, uh, and uh, that 
uh, would result from uh, the present crisis. Mm -hmm. Now, all of Europe uh, has a traumatic uh, backlog mm -hmm. of infrastructure mm -hmm. investment. In Germany, two trillion backlog uh, of uh, infrastructure alone. Already in 2012, we presented a plan for the new economic miracle of Southern Europe, Mediterranean, and Africa as an alternative to the devastating austerity policy of the Troika, which has destroyed Greece, Italy, Spain, and so forth. Now, in light of the escalation of the refugee crisis, all of these development projects being put on the table would be a complete game changer and install uh, hope in, in the population. Now, Africa, uh, right now, because of a combination of wars and the denial of economic development due to the policies of the IMF and other monetarist agencies, uh, there may be some quotes that we can discuss that uh, uh, has now uh, is now very more like uh, hell on earth rather than uh, home countries, and therefore people are fleeing. Yeah. There are 60 million people, according to the UN uh, Human Rights Commission, on on the road right now, and more will it be if, if this is not changed. So uh, this is uh, the planned uh, uh, railway system, and these are water systems which could uh, change the situation. Now, the word language as a concrete basis for a peace order of the 21st century, however, requires uh, a complete uh, different paradigm. We have to eliminate the legitimacy of geopolitics. The very idea that one nation or a group of nations has a legitimate interest and can pursue those against another group and if need, even with military means or even a preventive first strike, which is what is being done right now, is not only uh, ludicrous and cannot work, but it is a crime. According to the Nuremberg Statutes, to prepare a war of aggression is a crime. It should be possible. Now, mankind will only be able to survive the present existential crisis if we make a qualitative jump to define the common interest of mankind as a point of reference. The question where should mankind be, not at the next, at, at the next election turn of the politician, but in 100 years from now, or in 1,000 years from now. Uh, that should guide our decision making. Now, the word land bridge does not only complete the infrastructural development of the landlocked areas of the whole world, but uh, it would define the next phase of the evolution of the human race by bringing the infrastructure development into space. We think that you know, space is really the, uh, the next phase of the human development. Now, the best thing would be if there would be an emergency meeting of the UN General Assembly and say, look, the world is about to crash against the wall. Let's have a change of paradigm. Let's put the world language on the agenda or a G20 meeting or at least uh, some prominent leaders from government and industry, science, and culture would basically uh, demand this. Now, the idea of the word language establishes a higher level of reason, where all the historical and ethnic conflicts disappear or tend to become neutralized into a higher geometry. If you look at the tensions between China and Japan, sometimes, you know, you think you are forced to repeat their history. Uh, but if you add, for example, to Japan and China, uh, uh, other countries like India, Russia, Southeast Asia, and the European nations <coughs> for a peaceful development plan, uh, which had a, would have a mutual benefit and a win-win perspective, uh, then uh, these differences uh, become less, or they tend to disappear. There are obvious differences to the situation of the 30 years war. But in Europe, people only came to the negotiation table after actually 150 
years of religious warfare because they realized that if they would continue the war, there would be absolutely nobody left to enjoy the victory. And the peace of Westphalia, which was the result of these negotiations, established for the first time the idea that there can be no peace if you do not take the interest of the other into account. And that foreign policy must be based not on revenge, but on love. And that treaty became the basis for international law and the UN Charter. Now, unfortunately, today the respect for international law has vanished to a very far-reaching degree, especially after the intervention in Libya. The UN Security Council does not function anymore. And therefore, I think to get out of this crisis, we have to develop international law further. The principle which must be agreed upon and which must enclose all following aspects as a preamble is the idea that the common aims of mankind uh, are what has to be the basis and that there can be no legitimate interest of one nation or a group of nations uh, against that. Now, the principles of the UN Charter must remain, um, but uh, this preamble must take into account the higher lawfulness, which is called in different cultures in different ways. In Europe, we call it natural law, then there is a higher order in the physical universe which you must obey, and in Asian philosophy, it's generally called uh, cosmic order. It expresses the idea that mankind as a whole can only survive in the physical universe at large if the political and economic practices on Earth are being brought into cohesion with the laws governing our universe. And that can be expressed today not only in a metaphysical way, but proven through natural science. We have to start with the fact that man is not an animal. And therefore, we are not condemned to remain in the modes of the past, but our creativity can discover again and again universal principles about the physical universe. And when these principles are applied in production, they increase the living standard, the longevity, and they change the mode of reproduction in general. And Johannes Kepler discovered habitation and the solar system uh, as a unified uh, system, a uh, principle. He created the basis for mankind to be a completely different species, no longer bound to Earth, but being part of the solar system. When Einstein discovered the theory of general relativity, he created the basis for space travel. Uh, by uh, basically uh, man's, uh, the, the foundation for man's exploration of space. It is now clear from the history of the Earth that the, the defining influences on the changing, of the changing relationship of our solar system with the galaxy, uh, which affect cycles of climate change and variations in the evolutionary process of life. But we have still to discover the unifying principle of our galaxy, as Kepler had discovered that principle for the solar system. So what does this all mean in terms of the role of human creativity being an integral part of the laws of the physical universe? Because we are not an outside observer. The human mind, human creativity is part of the laws of the universe. Now, the next phase uh, is uh, the work of, in space. Uh, in the galaxy and beyond uh, requires the collaboration of top scientists of different nations to discover the laws of the universe uh, as a new scientific frontier. We have yet to discover powers of mankind which are completely unknown. You can't even ask the right question right now. Uh, and these future discoveries are so unknown like, for example, the idea of mining helium-3 on the moon for a fusion economy on Earth was completely unknown during the times of Kepler. The Earth is not a closed system, but life on Earth is defined by the lawfulness of the solar system's interaction with the galaxy. 
And we have said to discover the unifying principles of the many, many billions of galaxies out there. The meaning of life is the advancement of mankind's ability to master the challenges of discovering the pathway or the necessary next discovery for mankind's ability to continue to exist in the millions and even billions of years ahead. So far, we only have discovered the shadow of that principle. It is therefore necessary to, to return to the principles of physical economy and real science and eliminate monetarism. We have to restore the historical knowledge of the theoretical foundations of the different industrial revolutions, uh, a knowledge which has almost completely been eliminated from the textbooks and uh, you know, algorithms have taken over all aspects of life and the problem with algorithms is that they are a projection of the past of statistical experience and they, they do not include uh, creativity and, and new discoveries. Now, uh, in fact, the, all the industrial revolutions in the United States, as well as Germany, Japan, Russia, and more recently, the Chinese economic miracle have been based on the principles of physical economy discovered by Gottfried Leibniz, continued by Friedrich List, the American economy, the uh, system of economy by Matthew and Henry C. Carey and Count Witte. The Meiji Restoration in Japan, which rapidly transformed Japan into one of the major economic powers, was thanks to the theories of Alexander Hamilton and Friedrich List. Erasmus Smith, a very close collaborator of Lincoln's economic advisor Henry Carey, was sent by the Ulysses Grant administration as an official advisor to the Meiji Restoration. What is generally not known, but absolutely provable uh, by the historical record, the, the rapid transformation of Germany from a feudal state into an economic powerhouse was based entirely on the theory of British list and of Bismarck's encounter with the economic model of Henry C. Carey, which he got to know through Wilhelm von Kardorf, who was the head of the Industrial Association of Germany at the time. And Germany would not have become an industrial nation, but for Bismarck's conversion from a follower of the free market economy to a protectionist of the protectionist policy of this and carry. The Chinese economic miracle of the last 30 years, uh, including the policies of the new Silk Road and the new banking uh, alternative system with the AIIB, the New Development Bank, the Silk Road and the Maritime Fund, follow these traditions. The fifth World Congress of China Studies in 2013 in Shanghai uh, and the 2014 this conference in Reutlingen emphatically made the point that Friedrich List is the most favored economist in China and not Adam Smith. This regarded the development of the productive powers of labor and industrial capacities as more important than statistical wealth. And he would be an adamant critic uh, of the asset-driven economies of today. In the paper, he submitted to a contest of the French Academy in Science of Sciences in 1837, he developed a vision of the future role of transport systems which he called uh, uh, space and time economy. Uh, and this all contains ideas which still are extremely actual uh, for the world language today. Now this is a new map of lists proposal uh, for railroads in Germany and uh, Europe. Uh, and he, he described this, uh, he said, uh, the continuous perfection of transport and communication systems uh, are the precondition for the focus of humanity, enabling human beings to unfold increasingly all potentials given to them by nature. The more talents could exchange their ideas and collaborate in all areas, the greater focus would be in all areas of knowledge and the more science and the arts 
would be inspired and spread to all sectors and disciplines. And he practically anticipated our jet age, saying that the easier it is for human beings to move from place to place, the more they would save time and compress space, the more the development and efficiency of his powers would increase and utilize the material riches of nature for his purposes. The impact of this characteristics of what he called the space and time economy uh, would be demonstrated by the wealth of nations which did develop an advanced transport and communication system even if their natural environment was unfavorable. The high degree of speed, regularity, and cost efficiency of transport would facilitate new levels of the development of the mental and material uh, productive forces. In an almost prophetic forecast, he saw this development orientating towards dividing all nations into one humanity, into a, a republic of the planet based on the economy of mankind, as he called it. The realization of the world land bridge proceeding from the common aims of mankind is eminently possible in the near term. But it must be accompanied by a dialogue between the high phases of the different cultures of the world. For the age, many Asian countries, that means the revival of Confucius. For India, it means the Gupta period and the Indian Renaissance. For Russia, Pushkin, Bernatsky, for Italy, the Italian Renaissance. For Germany, uh, the German classical music and poetry. And once people study the high points of the other culture, then out of that knowledge develops admiration and eventually even love. And I think that only in this way can the human species fulfill its potential and become truly adult and become the immortal species in our universe. To realize this vision requires individuals who are guided by a passionate love for mankind. Thank you.